Hey guys, Steve from Ball Strong Suspension here. Welcome to the Tuesday Tune. This week we're going to be talking about one of the fundamentals of suspension setup, SAG. Now, most of you will be familiar with SAG and what it is. For those who aren't aware, uh, this is not a tutorial on how to set your SAG. SAG is essentially how far your suspension compresses with rider weight on it. So when you climb aboard your bike uh, and you stand there, static position, flat ground, how much your suspension compresses with just your weight on it. That is your static sag. Now this is generally the first step in any suspension setup to give you a baseline spring rate. So the spring rate can be either a coil spring rate or it can be an air pressure for your forehoot shock. The reason sag is used as this first step is that it gives us some indication of how stiff the spring is relative to your weight because it's a dimensionless number. We're using percentages, uh, not you know, distances. And the reason that that is uh, dimensionless and the reason that it is transferable from one person to another, one rider to another, one bike to another, is that the spring rate is then, by the SAG, measured in proportion to your weight. So if you have, for example, 25% SAG, then it will take about four times uh, your body weight to fully compress the, the spring to bottom out. So to give you some indication of how that all works, let's have a look at two different spring rates here, the blue line and the red line. Now the blue line on this force versus travel, well, travel displacement uh, graph, the blue line is the steeper line. So we can see that that is the stiffer spring rate. The red line obviously is a bit flatter, uh, softer spring rate. Now the blue line, if we draw in a line at a certain force, arbitrary force, and say this is the rider weight load, and at where that load uh, crosses the blue line, that will give us the sag percentage that we get with that spring. In this case, I've set that up to be 25%. With the red line, at the same rider weight load, we're getting 33% sag. And so what we can see from these little marks here is that what that gives us is with 33% sag, it takes three times the rider's weight to fully bottom out the spring. Now this is obviously assuming that we have a linear spring, a linear leverage rate if we're looking at the back end of the bike and so forth. So there are confounding factors uh, that this is not accounting for, but it's to give you a basic understanding of why this is transferable from one person to another. So with the red spring, it takes three times uh, your body weight, so an acceleration, a vertical acceleration of three G's to bottom out the spring. With the blue one here, it takes four times. So that is how you can see uh, this as a reciprocal fraction. So 25% is one on four, takes four on one times that, uh, that body weight in order to bottom out the suspension. I think everybody is probably aware of why we need sag. Uh, we need negative travel with the bike. And that means that the suspension has to not only be able to react to bumps that are coming from below and allow the wheel to move up out of the way, it also has to be able to follow the ground down as it drops away because otherwise we're relying only on either gravity or the ability of the rider to push the front wheel or the rear wheel uh, down to track the ground. So sag is very important for traction. Um, as we discussed a little bit last week, there is a difference between static sag and dynamic ride height. So dynamic ride height is the average ride height that uh, your bike is seeing over a short space of time on average when you're accounting for the fact that the bumps and the damping will basically hold it in a, a different average position to your sag position. Now this also means, uh, this also brings us to another point where we measure sag on flat ground with a static position. In reality, the rider moves around on the bike and you're not usually on flat ground, you're usually going slightly uphill, slightly downhill, or steeply uphill, or very steeply downhill. So static sag is only a starting point, not an ending point. Now, when it comes to measuring sag, there's a few different schools of thought. The most common one is to measure your sag in what is referred to as the attack position. So this is basically your riding position, uh, standing on the pedals, arms um, slightly bent, uh, looking ahead, as though you are descending aggressively. The issue with doing it in this manner is that that position is not very consistent. Now, the most important thing when we're setting sag, or measuring sag really, not setting sag, um, is that you do it consistently. 
So when you measure your sag, you need to make sure that each time you do it, it's done the same way. And so I'm going to show you very quickly my preferred method of uh, body positioning for setting sag. So my preferred method of positioning your body when setting sag is to make sure that, that all your body weight is directly over the bottom bracket. The way that that's done is by leaning the bike against the wall, standing on the pedals, releasing as much pressure as you can uh, from the handlebars, making sure that you're not pushing on the chains, there's a little bit of slop in the bottom bracket there, off the brakes, and from there, it's a little bit of a bounce to break the friction, front and rear if necessary. So from there, we can make sure that our weight is always spread between the front and rear wheels evenly. Because as long as your weight is directly over the bottom bracket, then we'll always have the same front to rear weight distribution. And that's really important for measuring sag consistently. If we don't have a consistent body position, uh, then it will throw your sag measurements off. You'll make adjustments and then you'll go back and measure sag and find that it's traveled in the opposite direction of what you expected and things like that. They get very confusing. So even though this isn't representative of the way that you ride, for comparing sag measurements, it's close enough in terms of uh, front, to rear, front to rear weight distribution and it's also the only truly consistent method of positioning your body weight. There are also some other limitations of SAG. First of all, the difficulty in translating it across all riders on all bikes is that the leverage rate of the bike has a big effect. Uh, any non-linearity of the spring has a big effect. So if your bike or your spring is more progressive, you run more SAG. Uh, if it is digressive, uh, as in has a falling rate, leverage rate, uh, or anything like that, then you need to run less sag. Then there are bikes that have combinations of all these and then it gets very confusing and the correct sag amount uh, becomes very unclear. On that note, there is no such thing as a correct amount of sag. Like all things with suspension, there is an appropriate range. Uh, sag is a lot less critical to get precise as a ride height than it is with motorized vehicles because the rider can move their body weight up and down very easily which is something that cars have a lot of trouble with. So the exact amount of sag that you have is not important as such on a mountain bike. It is critical, uh, sorry, it is useful only as an indicator of how stiff the spring is relative to your body weight and as something that you can measure to compare. Uh, if, you, if you say swap bikes or you swap shocks or something like that, you can measure your sag on the old shock. Say you had a, uh, let's say you started with a Fox float on one bike and then you measure your sag and then you put a uh, RockShox Monarch on there. So everything runs at slightly different pressures there. And instead of trying to translate the pressure that you had in one shock to another, you can translate the sag measurement. And that will give you a much closer uh, feel in terms of spring rate than measuring the same pressure because the pressure in the two different shocks will give you the same pressure in the two different shocks will give you two different spring rates. So that is why it's particularly useful. So let's discuss some of the limitations um, of sag, particularly with the fork. Now, the fork is on obviously quite an angle to the ground. So that means that the vertical force that we have coming up at the wheel um, is trying to bend the fork. That binds the bushing somewhat and creates friction. Because of this, the friction in the fork means that it's much harder to get a consistent sag measurement. As a result, it's not something I personally rely on. I'll set it approximately and from then adjust only with spring rates or pressures. Uh, because forks run at a one-to-one -one motion ratio, that is, you know, the, the spring is moving the exact same distance that the axle is, unlike with the rear wheel, it's much easier to translate uh, either spring pressures for a particular fork or spring rates for a particular fork from one rider to another just based on weight. So as a result, manufacturers are in a much better position to give you a starting point for the type of, uh, for the spring rate or the amount of pressure that you should be running in a particular fork. So particularly on RockShox forks, have a look at the sticker on the back of the leg, on the lower leg there. That will usually give you uh, some idea of the most appropriate spring rate for you or a starting point for an appropriate spring rate for you. Uh, otherwise, check the manufacturer's websites. So, again, without using SAG on the front, uh, specifically, 
my recommendation is to start with you know a, a ballpark figure of SAG, 20%, uh, 15%, somewhere in that range, and then adjust to suit whether you want it firmer or whether you want it softer. Try to measure that. Like you can measure it five times in a row, you won't get the same measurement any of those five times quite commonly. So that is very difficult to do. Especially if you're not holding a consistent body position, as I just mentioned. So holding that consi consistent body position is really critical uh, to accurately measuring your sag. When measuring sag on coil shocks, I recommend that you do it with absolutely minimal preload. Preload only affects the dynamic ride height, and therefore it does affect the sag, but it isn't affecting the spring rate. So if we're using sag to gauge spring rate, then artificially manipulating that by increasing the preload will decrease your sag and give you a false idea of how stiff the spring is relative to your weight. Anyway guys, that about wraps it up for this week. Uh, any comments, questions, criticisms, please let us know in the comments as per usual. Uh, we look forward to hearing them and until next week, we'll see you then.